Good evening, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy, and we're continuing our adventures with the chakras in everyday life. So last week we talked in general about self-realization and a little bit about how the chakras play into it. Now we'll begin to get a little more specific sailing through our adventure. If you have questions, especially questions that are relevant to the stream that I'm talking about, but any questions you have, please uh, take a moment. You can put them in the chat box at any time. If they're specifically relevant to the flow that I'm talking about, we'll take them tonight. If not, we'll save them up for another occasion. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Bless us with deep insight as we explore this very important, very inward subject. Help us to understand that all reality emanates from our point of origin. Help us to understand with our minds and feel with our spirits and feel with our hearts the profound and helpful truth contained in this subject that what we learn will gradually transform us from delusion-bound jivas into infinitely free children of God. Om. Peace. Amen. We'll start with a couple of chants. My friend Keshava will sing for us. We'll have a moment or two of silent meditation, and then we'll start the subject. Oh, 
and coax thee to my altar of peace in the temple of Samadhi in the temple of bliss in the temple of Samadhi in the temple of bliss I will meet thee I will touch thee, I will love thee, and coax thee to my altar of bliss, and coax thee to my altar of bliss, and coax thee to my altar of peace, and coax thee to my altar of peace and coax thee to my altar of Thou art 
tells me thou art dark, O my mother divine. Let's meditate together for a few moments. All right, my friends, here we go. As last week, those of you who tuned in, um, I presume I, so I got an email from at least someone who's joining the class now, so I presume that if you didn't hear last week, you'll get a chance. I talked for an hour and a half, and I believe I said the word chakra in about the last five minutes, which may be a record for me, but perhaps not. But what I was laying out was the entire context in which the chakras make sense. Because the chakras nowadays, people are pulling them out as something that's independent of the rest of uh, the, the progression of the soul from delusion to freedom. But where the chakras really become a very practical grounding element in our spiritual life is when we see them in the whole. So what I ended up talking about last week, which just to, to bring us where we were, is I was talking about the chakras as if that this was a, almost a piano keyboard. And every tone has a certain actual vibration. And we're going from delusion, which is the belief that matter is the only reality, to Christ consciousness, self-realization, self-realization. And every action, thought, feeling that we have falls somewhere on the spectrum of what we think is true, what we're trying to accomplish, where we think happiness comes from, somewhere on this spectrum. And the chakras in a, in a vertical... Now, what happens when I start talking about the chakras? Sometimes we go horizontal, sometimes we go vertical. Then sometimes we'll talk about a whole way of thinking about the chakras that, that then, then there's a whole other way of thinking about the chakras and they don't all necessarily mesh together because what we're trying to do in all of this is we're trying to verbalize something that is non-physical and is beyond rational words to describe. So what we keep doing is we keep using images and different ways of thinking about it that will give us a feeling and, and enough concepts that we can then begin to work with it more deeply. And as I also said last week, we will have some experiential aspect to this course, but this is not primarily an experiential course. There are many other times within Ananda Palo Alto and various places, many places, where you can have that kind of experience. We will do that. But what I'm trying to give us more is a philosophical understanding. So when we start talking about the chakras properly, I was doing, a, I was doing a, a horizontal line, but when we think about the chakras, we think of it in a vertical line. Now, the first thing that you have to understand, I'm going to have to just keep putting that up and down. You have to understand, let's see, the chakras, um, the, the, the physical body is manifested around the chakras. So if you think of a plumb line from the top of your head that runs right down through the center of your body from the top of your head to the base of the tailbone, but not on, on the front or the back, but a, vi a vibration of energy that runs right through the center that is actually a, an, 
active magnetic force and that that which we call our body, which is this collection of all the things that make it appear to be matter, is held together because of the life force that is flowing through the center of our body up and down the, the spine, not the physical spine, although it has a physical manifestation, but I'm talking about the chakras are an astral form. So the, the physical body manifests around it and reflects the presence of the chakras. Every place there's a chakra, there manifests a, a, a nerve cluster and that nerve cluster takes care of certain parts of the body but the nerve cluster is held together by the magnetism of the chakra, but the magnetism of the chakra is not physical. I received an email from someone who'd had a hysterectomy, had many of her female organs taken out, and had been told that, that along with her um, uterus, they had taken out her second chakra, and she was quite concerned about that. I told her that would be one heck of a surgeon, that I really didn't think that that's what had happened, because it, these are completely non-physical, that the whole body can be destroyed and the chakras are not touched. And in fact, Master said that when, <clears throat> when the sperm and ovum unite, when those first two cells come together, the place they come together is the medulla, which I spoke of last week, as this is where self-identity, um, our, our sense of self identified with the body. When the sperm and ovum come together, Master said, there's a flash of light in the astral world and those souls that are ready to incarnate that are in tune with that flash of light rush to get into that particular womb. Master said, if more than one rush, sometimes you have twins or triplets like that. Um, and he said that, that first sperm and ovum coming together is the, is the beginning of the physical body. But it's not, it doesn't begin until the life force comes into it because uh, it, matter is animated by spirit. Spirit comes first. Now this is a question that people ask in terms of terminating pregnancies and I have to only say what Master said. The sperm and ovum come together, a flash of light, a jiva, an individual soul enters. And then because the jiva has entered, what the jiva brings with it is it brings its entire magnetic pattern and its magnetic pattern is its karma. In other words, the destiny that's bringing it into physical manifestation, bringing it into this world. And that the energy pattern in the chakras is the force that begins to pull together the atoms and the molecules and everything that's needed to make a physical body. And the first thing that happens when you look at the little book of your developing embryo, I remember seeing these pictures, I have no idea how they get photographs like this, but early on, your little developing embryo looks like a matchstick. Because what's happened is, from, from the top of the spine, the energy goes down to the bottom of the spine. And it, it's very interesting that from the top of the spine to the base of the, um, from the top of the head to the base of the spine is the, is the energy, uh, what, what an energy pocket where the chakras exist. But what's interesting is you can exist with all your limbs cut off. You can cut me at the shoulder and you can cut me at the thigh so that I'm, I'm nothing but the, you know, the shape of a worm and I'm still completely present. A person can be completely present. But if you intrude into the energy field where the chakras exist, which is to cut off the top of the head or to cut off, uh, you know, above the hip line where the hips, where the, um, where the legs meet the torso, then the body can't survive after that. Because what gives it life force is the presence of these chakras. And what's happening when the baby begins to develop is individuality comes into existence, the jiva identifies with the physical body and at the same time brings with it the potential for God realization. And then it extends itself all the way down to the material plane. So then what we begin to work with, with these, this is really a crummy system, but I guess it's the system I've got in place here. So let me see if I can make this work a little better. In theory, I should be able to put this 
in front of the white, whoops, in front of the whiteboard. Now I know that there's computer ways you can do this, but I'm old school. There we are, we've got it. Okay, um, so there are, there are various um, qualities and, and words that are written here. This chakra, <laughs> I've had this chakra chart for about 30 years. <laughs> Maybe it's time to upgrade. Um, there's also a piece of paper that's available to you, you know, a, a PDF through, which has all the different characteristics of the chakras. You can see the small print here. So you don't have to worry about what you can and can't read on this board. It's not important. All I'm really having this for is for this, because otherwise I have to keep going like this, and that doesn't really work very well. Okay. So what happens is, this is where the energy starts, and it extends all the way down to this point, and each one of the chakras represents um, an, an element. Now, we think of elements as having to do with chemistry. What, Master, what Swami explains is that chemical elements are looking at the elements that make up the material plane and then dividing them all up. They're all variations on the earth element. When we're talking about the chakras and we start talking about elements, we're using it in a very different way. Um, the best way to think of it is it's elemental stages of manifestation from pure spirit into the material plane. The very nature of taking a physical body is that we have to get all the way down to the material plane. If we don't get all the way down to the earth element, there's no physical body. We're in the astral world. We have our consciousness. We have all our characteristics. As I was explaining some last week, we are nothing but a pattern of energy. And that pattern of energy is the sum total of of our consciousness on the range from pure delusion to God realization. And that's a moving target. And that's how the chakras really become relevant because the chakras are the, the energy, energy storage fields that we affect by our actions and our attitudes and our spiritual practices and all sorts of things. And we are constantly shifting that energy pattern. And when we become serious about moving from delusion to God realization, we begin to work conscientiously on shifting that pattern. And that pattern exists whether you have a material body or not. Because of that pattern, we make a certain kind of spiritual body, a physical body. And then when we have that physical body, the fact that the physical body is held together by the pattern of energy in the chakras, the energy in the chakras is really the engine which is driving the destiny of that physical body. You know, what you look like, what gender you are, what culture you are, what kind of um, family you have, what kind of opportunities you have, whether you have good or bad luck, um, whether just everything about you is the energy field stored in the chakras acting upon the universal energy field to repel or attract. And everything, that's why the chakras become, once you begin to understand them, everything about your life comes from the chakras. And we can understand it and work with it from both sides. By the time we're finished with this course, this is only class number two of five, we'll have, I hope, I'll do my best, to give us an understanding <clears throat> of the positive and negative qualities, as primarily of the, these five chakras, and I'll explain in a moment why. We concentrate mostly on those. And we, we work it from two angles. Once we know what the characteristics of each of these chakras are, we can look at our life and say, oh, I'm strong in that characteristic, or oh, I'm really weak in that characteristic. And then not only can we work from the outside to cultivate it, but we can also then begin to work from the inside to develop the internal magnetism, and then our ability to shift our consciousness becomes stronger and stronger. We can, also, we can just understand ourselves in a bigger picture when we have an understanding of the elements that each chakra represents and therefore the characteristics of that chakra. Now, even though we talk about the higher chakras and the lower chakras, every chakra is good. Every chakra is good because every chakra is essential. And all the chakras work together um, uh, for our ultimate fulfillment. 
so what we're really working with is that every chakra has an essential characteristic. And those characteristics can either be expressed, can either be directed upward to draw our energy upward toward harmony with the spiritual eye, or that chakra, the energy of that chakra can be expressed what you might call horizontally, just out into the world on its own terms, and that same quality can be used instead of to free us from delusion. It can be used to lock us ever more deeply into delusion. So it's not the chakra itself that's good or bad, it's the way the energy is directed. Now these five chakras have to do with our personality and the way we express ourselves in the world. Um, there are many different, as I, uh, holding up this piece of paper with all the little tiny print on it, you know, each of the chakras has all these different things. They have colors, they have gemstones, they have planets, they have signs of the zodiac. They also relate, these five chakras relate to the heroes of the Mahabharata, to the five Pandava brothers, who are the forces of good in that great epic where Krishna is the leading force and the five Pandavas are devotees of Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita, the most um, beloved scripture of India, which Master himself took the trouble to comment on and Swami Kriyananda created a huge commentary of Master's teachings and Master's mission to um, the West, among other things, was to show how the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible are the same scripture. And the five characters, the, the Gita is a chapter in the Mahabharata, and it's a dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna, and they're on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and Arjuna begins to um, have a moment of tremendous doubt about the battle that he's engaged in. Krishna's driving his chariot. Krishna takes Arjuna off to a place where he can see the battle arrayed, and then talks to him about the nature of life and the nature of engagement and what is required for freedom and where true happiness comes from. And that's just one chapter in this big epic where these five brothers who represent righteousness are warring against the hundred brothers who represent unrighteousness, and it's the spiritual force versus the material force. Yogananda calls the the hundred brothers who oppose the Pandavas, he calls him king material desire and all his minions, like this. And the kingdom they're fighting over is a true historical event, but the real image is the kingdom they're fighting over is our consciousness. The battle of Kurukshetra is the field of battle in which the two sides of our own nature war against each other. On one side you, you have the Kauravas, which represent everything that we've always been, that we feel comfortable being, that we just want to settle back in and stay there. The Pandavas represent our divine potential, the necessity to reach upward, to expand beyond what we already know, and to be guided by Krishna. And Krishna is a specific avatar, but Krishna is also, the, the word Krishna is the same word as Christ, and that word is a title, the Anointed One, the Self-Realized Master, the Pandavas are guided by Krishna, and the, the point of ch the chakra that represents Krishna is the point between the eyebrows. This is the point of Christ consciousness. Krishna doesn't fight, but he guides the Pandavas in the battle. So when we start thinking about our own chakras, what we're working with is who is in charge of these chakras? Um, is each chakra sort of doing its own thing in its own way, just reaching out to the world and trying to express itself? Or are all the chakras working in harmony with the superior guidance of Krishna? And so what we're, what we're trying to do with our chakras, and these various lines represents the way the energy flows. These are all aspects we, we'll probably touch on eventually. But the ideal way for the energy, let me just, let me give you another picture here first. The medulla, this is one chakra, as I spoke last time, this is, this is individuality. This is the individuality identified with the physical world, the physical form, with limitation. In other words, this is ego. But the life force that animates this is the divine life force. 
But the ego draws that divine life force and limits it to, to the world the, of the body. And this point is the point of Christ consciousness where we know ourselves to, still to be an individual, but we recognize that that individual is actually one with the infinite. And all of spiritual practice, as I said last week, is to shift our sense of self from the medulla to the spiritual eye. Now, when Master teaches us the energization exercises, which is his specific, unique contribution to the science of yoga, where we use willpower and concentration to draw energy into ourselves and to direct that energy. The, the energization exercises look like they're physical exercises, but what we're actually doing is we're using physical energy in order to develop willpower and concentration. Because the problem in life is really very simple. We don't have control over our energy. I mean, if you stop and analyze every problem you get into, it's because we don't have control over our energy. We have a project to do. We don't concentrate hard enough. Our mind wanders. Fear comes into it. We don't know what to do. Somebody speaks to us. We have a subconscious reaction of some kind that we can't control. And we try to meditate and our mind goes all over the place because our energy, we don't have mastery over our energy. So when we're using the energization exercises, we're training the will so that we can set our intention and back that intention with directed energy. So in the energization exercises, we learn that energy flows into the body through the medulla and we can pull that um, with willpower and concentration. It's a whole practice in itself, which it's easy for you to learn through any one of the Anandas that exist around the world. So we draw life force energy through the medulla. So ideally, what we want is when the energy comes in through the life force, and I'm just going to sort of say this as if this is how it works, because it is more or less how it works, that life force has to go all the way down to the first chakra, because this is the earth chakra, it has to energize because there's physical nerve plexes in, uh, in front of all these that all have to have that life force in us in order for us to stay in our bodies and have those bodies be vital. So the energy has to extend all the way down to the earth chakra. But the question is, does it then just, do we just um, sort of like, are these chakras, people talk about the chakras being blocked. What they actually are is they're leaking, is what they're doing. <laughs> Blocked is also a way to put it, but leaking is more like it. If the life force just comes in, it goes down to the first chakra, which represents the earth, which represents security. I'll talk about it more in a minute. If immediately that, that energy goes out to buy things and get things and acquire things and hold things and hoard things, I had the strangest moment, and I have no idea where it came from. It must have been just some weird past life memory. I remember I was first, I was, I grew up in a family that was relatively utilitarian. Our values were intellectual, not material. We lived comfortably, but it wasn't a home that was filled with beautiful things. My mother had one cabinet of, of some china and some crystal, but it just wasn't the way we lived. So I was already at Ananda, and I was with Swamiji visiting a friend, and she had some beautiful porcelain teacups. And I actually believe it was the first time in my life that I ever actually held in my hand and used something that refined. And I remember, and this is just an ordinary water glass, but I remember sipping the tea like that and I, I felt the porcelain and it was so delicate and it was so just beautiful in my hand. And I said something like, oh, I see why people like things like this, because I'd just been very utilitarian in my life. And Swami says, careful. He said, before you become a yogi, um, you, 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 I think he just said it that way, before you're ready to renounce the world, you've experienced all that the world has to offer. Meaning, and he said, and you don't want to reawaken those samskars, those memories of material things and the pleasure that they give you. So the earth element is looking out at the world, and it has many factors, which again, I'll explain more clearly in just a moment. But one of them is we're looking for security, and where do we get our security? So the funny thing that happened to me 
there's this closet in the house where I live in. There's a stairwell, and there's right by the stairwell, there's a door, and the closet goes way back like this, and under the stairwell, it's one of those really, you know, sort of hard to get to the back of closets. I had this weird desire one day <laughs> to have that closet be filled with bars of gold. <laughs> just sort of like, I remembered the Daffy Duck cartoons. Am I just really dating myself when I say this? There was some, a character called Uncle Scrooge, and Scrooge just loved money, and he had heaps of coins, and he would you know, play in his coins, and he would throw his bags of money around. All of a sudden, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to open that door and have it be filled with gold, and I would go in there and be with my gold. It was just, it didn't last long. But while it was happening, it was really happening. Now, as a rule, I don't think like that. And even though I do have some nice porcelain cups now, and I'm not really afraid about them, um, many people have a strong inclination that is not just a weird passing thought, that the more they can accumulate, whether they actually want to accumulate it and hold it in their hands, but the more they can accumulate of the earth's goods, the stronger and the better they feel. That's because your chakra is leaking, because the energy is pulled in through the medulla, and it, it animates the chakra, which it needs to, because the quality of every chakra is required for us to be triumphant. This is why it represents the five um, righteous Pandava brothers. All of those five brothers have to work together. Everyone contributes for us to triumph in this great battle of consciousness between delusion and righteousness. But they need to be guided by Krishna. So the energy animates all of these, but we want it to then come here. And from here, each of those chakras can be animated to play its part, to do what God intended for it to do, but it acts in harmony with our highest well-being instead of just grabbing the energy and running and doing what it wants to do. Now, these are, you know, as I said earlier, these are sort of ways of thinking about it that help us to understand. So I'm going to now just go to the first chakra and really talk about what the characteristics are, what it's, what it's like when it's operating co in cooperation with Krishna, I'm going to keep with that image for now, with the spiritual eye, and what it's like when it ha has all that life force, but it is not directed from <clears throat> our, our best interests spiritually. So this is also stages of manifestation and stages of ever-increasing solidity. The way it goes is this quality, the, this chakra is called ether. And ether is not the stuff that puts you to sleep when you go to the dentist office or whatever it is that they use. Ether is a, a, an ancient concept. And the way Master described it is, and this is like, at least my mind boggles, but it's, I find it interesting to listen to. Ether is the substance that creates the illusion of space. You know, space appears to be something. It's not something that you can put your hands on, but space is, seems to be really there. When we used to travel, this is being recorded in September of 2020, so we haven't traveled at all this year, but we will, I'm sure, travel again. I've traveled to India on a number of occasions, which is, you know, literally halfway around the world. It's a complete shift from day to night. It's a 12-hour time zone. Is it 10,000 miles, something like that? Yeah, because I've made the trip frequently, the flight usually is 24 hours from when I step out of the door of my house until I step into the door of wherever I'm going to sleep when I finally reach there. It's, it's a very neat sort of journey, and I've made it many times, and that's what, that's what it takes. The flight isn't 24 hours, but that's the time for me to move through all that space. It, space holds somehow. It's an illusion. It's part of... Maya. It's not really there, but the ether element, they say, this is just how it's explained, holds it and it seems to be there. So spirit has no form. If we go up to the crown chakra and even here, we'll talk about this again more clearly, but spirit descends. We descend from spirit. And the most subtle form entering into the, to the material world 
we were, enter the world of space, which is called ether. Then ether becomes more gross in the sense of less subtle, not, hor not gross in the sense of horrible, but just less subtle. Becomes less subtle, and ether breaks up into gases. And this is where this, this element is air at the heart. Then air is, is like fiery gases, and then it descends to the fire itself. I'll, I'll do it backwards, and it also makes more sense. This chakra is fire. Then fire begins to cool, and it becomes molten, and this is liquid, water, and then this is earth. So doing it backwards, you can see how it, how it would work. This is solid matter. Okay, then, then solid matter, as it begins to refine a little bit, instead of being solid, it becomes molten. You can think of uh, a volcanic flow. It's solid rock, but then it's heated up. Fire is applied to it, and it becomes molten. And then more fire is applied to it, and then it is liberated into gas. The form is completely dissolved. Then the gas becomes even lighter. It moves to ether. Finally, it merges back into spirit. So all the way at the earth element, the characteristics of the first chakra is the fixity of form. And this is the world that we're living in, you know? If we didn't have a fixed form, we wouldn't be in a body. So in order to incarnate, it's not a bad thing. We have to come all the way down and have a body. That sperm and the ovum come together. The pattern of energy, which is the chakras, locks into that first cell, then begins to put out the magnetism to attract from the universe the elements it needs to gradually assemble this body. And so matter begins to coalesce. And you, you watch or the woman who's pregnant, the baby just begins to coalesce and, and until eventually the whole nervous system is built and the, the body is there. So then we have a form. And once the baby comes, you know, the life force just moves it. And that material form is the definition of who we are. So when we think of the earth element, what the earth element represents um, oh, there's many different ways to speak of it, but it represents um, our, our capacity to focus, to hold a commitment. I mean, because this is what the earth looks like. It holds a commitment. It's a solid reality. No matter what you do, you know, this is a piece of paper, this is a cough drop, this is a pen, this is the whiteboard, this is the stand, this is the cardboard. Now, we know that all of these things, the physicists tell us, are nothing but different forms of energy. But when we're on this plane, they all hold this form. And it, it's very solid for us. And what it represents for us is holding, is, is holding a loyal commitment, you know, and just taking a position and not moving from it. Now, the positive expression of this is to be steadfastly loyal to truth. The negative expression of this is to be pig-headed and stubborn and fanatical and narrow-minded and um, annoying to everyone around you and unwilling to be open to any kind of change. Loyalty, however, Master calls it, Master says, loyalty is the first law of God. So that's a reference to the earth chakra representing our committed energy to, to our, the, un, the principles that we have come to believe are true. And the, the first chakra is the foundation of building the power of the five Pandavas to be able to run our life in harmony with Krishna. And loyalty is also the first step on the spiritual path. Now, every one of these chakras has to work together, and as we build our way through it, we'll begin to explain how that works. So, but until we make a commitment and see what happens, and I sort of have to refer to others. Let's say, for example, the heart chakra is, you know, is very open and very airy and very expansive. People who are all heart, you know, are often, they can just embrace everyone. They can hold uh, everyone as a friend. I have friends that I travel with, and I'm, um, I perhaps am perhaps a little too strong in the earth element. I'm not really 
certain whether that's true or not, but I'm a little fixed in my ways. And when I travel, I'm not always able to step into other cultures as freely as some of my friends do. I have one particular friend that I travel with. She's, she's got so much air that wherever we go, that everybody is a friend to her. She has a, it's just a wonderful quality. And I, I always try to rise up into that energy that she has. But she can be a little flighty. She can be a little less focused on sort of what the main event is that we're trying to be involved in now, where I never lose focus about what the main event is because I have perhaps an excess of this. I'm amused now thinking about this. A friend of mine who does wonderful video work, wonderful video work, but we often disagree about what the music should be. I have certain ideas about music, she has others. We traveled together in New Zealand it was the first time when I got to know her, and we traveled about five years ago. And uh, uh, we, we filmed some of the parts of the trip, and we just filmed when we were in the car, and we filmed you know, just doing little things. It wasn't just the uh, formal programs that we gave. And afterwards, she put it all together into this marvelous little travelogue, which I really enjoyed completely, except there was a time when we were going down the road just traveling through the beautiful scenery of New Zealand in this big van that we had rented, because there were about seven of us in, yeah, probably seven, traveling down this road. And the music she put to it, I, I wasn't as familiar at that time with how video editing works. The music she put to it just went like this. And I said, it just... Never, it's going nowhere. It starts nowhere, it goes nowhere. And then she laughed, she said, it's a loop. <laughs> yeah, that's right, it's just a loop. It never has a beginning or an end. And I actually spoke really strongly. I said, I was never going in a loop. Like we were there, I think, for six weeks. We gave all these programs, we traveled not all over the country, but we traveled a bit. I was never going in a loop. I always knew where we were going. I always knew where we were, and I always knew where we were going. I said, maybe you were going in a loop, but I was never going in a loop. That's the first chakra. I knew exactly what we were doing there. We were, uh, we were beginning Ananda's work in New Zealand, as it happened, because it was a place we hadn't been very much before. We had a wonderful woman, Kavita Parshottam. For any of you who are from New Zealand who ever see this, she, she runs an Ananda Center there. She's an angel. We had a wonderful time together. It was always purposeful. That's what the first chakra does for us. Now, the first chakra is also exceedingly important because it's the source of our security. Now, this again, this is where the chakras in everyday life become very important to talk about. And there's a whole way you can run the chakras and, and show how they characterize how relationships are built when the chakras are in order. There's lots of different things we can do depending you know, how long five weeks turns out to be. But um, everybody has a need for security. It's just a fundamental human characteristic. We, once we are, once we identify as an ego, and become separate from the universal reality and begin to define ourselves as that way, this tremendous sense of insecurity inherently comes upon us because we are separated from our, our, our reality. And all of our, all of our um, journey, the soul's long journey from delusion um, to God realization is the search for security, the search for where I can be where I can absolutely be certain that I will find happiness and I will not suffer. So there's nothing, um, it's, it's God inspired to have a need for security. The question then becomes, and it's in the earth element, security is things are in a fixed form. I'm gonna set it up, it's going to stay that way, and therefore I can rely on it and I can be safe. I mean, that, think about it, that's what we're always trying to do, aren't we? You know, we want to have our retirement in order. We want to have our mortgage paid off. We want to have our health plan really in place. We want to have all our kids settled. You know, just all these different things that we just want to have in order. We want to put them in order. We want them to stay there and never move, which, of course, they don't obey, but that's part of the problem. 
But that's what we're always looking for. And, you know, you listen to... I remember when I began to realize that how much of popular music was just romantic songs and how much of it was just the same theme. I loved her, she loved me, but then she stopped loving me and she started loving him and then I started loving her and then now I wish I had her because she doesn't have him. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And it was just everybody looking to get it fixed and have it stay there. So the natural urge for security is what the earth chakra is all about and the um, development is the er of the earth chakra, which is related to loyalty, is what do I base, what is the source of my security? And because we're in the earth element, because we're in form and matter, there's a tremendous desire to find our security in form and matter. And because of the because we are an early Dwapara, in terms of the Yuga, this is not a very elevated age. And so there is, I mean, this entire planet is about money. It's just about money. I notice I don't listen to the radio very often except when I'm in the car. And then I kind of enjoy finding out what's going on. I listen to NPR, to the public radio station. And my, my, there's a lot of programs about money. And they, they just like... I just, I just sort of love the way they talk about it. I mean, they just like money, and it's a big deal. It's like, how do you get it? How do you keep it? How do you, how do you increase it? What's everybody else doing with their money? What's smart with your money? What's bad with your money? Why do people want money? Because it makes them feel safe. It was very interesting to me in the very early years of Ananda, I haven't thought about this in a while, in the very early years, like the first five, ten years there, um, we, were, we were quite impoverished, and we were all impoverished. So it was a, there were no tears. There were very few tears. There were few people in the community who had... We were, most of us were in our 20s, so we really had accumulated nothing of our own. Some people had either some, something inherited or some um, connection with their parents or a relative that would funnel more money into their lives. But most of us had very, very little. And it was a what I called at the time, it was a giant mom and pop store. So if you think about a mom and pop store, what that means, if such things still exist, is mom and pop run it, and it's just a complete integrated reality. It's like everything they make, they have to put back into the store and they take out as little as possible because then the enterprise isn't going to succeed. Nobody's taking advantage of anyone. It's a mom and pop enterprise and we want it to work. So Ananda for all of us was that. So we, we gave as much as we could of our time, energy, and talent, and we took as little in return as we could possibly take because everything we took out would diminish the possibility of success. So there was really almost nothing. I, um, I received $50 a month from Swami Kriyananda personally for a number of those years because I worked for him directly. He would open his wallet and he would count out two 20s in his hand and he would hand it to me. I would carry it to my little trailer and I would open this little pottery jar and I'd put it in there. And I didn't have a bank account. I never had a bank account for like 12 years or something like that. I just had this jar. I mean, sort of, I had a kind of mystic relationship with the jar because it was opaque. It was very important that it be opaque because that gave God the opportunity to multiply it. If I could watch it through clear glass, then I, that wouldn't have worked. It had to be opaque. But one way or another, there was always money in that jar when I needed it. And if it wasn't in the jar, I would find it in my coat pocket. Or I had one friend who sometimes would slip it into my coat pocket, which is, I think, where it got there, how it got there. But let me finish with the thought. Let's see, what was I trying to say? Oh, yes. But it was interesting, some of us were very, very comfortable with that. You see, karma is different. And I'm not going to claim anything special in this respect. God knows I have many things that frighten me and that I cling to in this world. That's just the given. Let's just take that as the given. But, but I've not, money has not been one of them. It doesn't mean that I'm free of it. It's just right now, it not, has not been my issue. And I've had what I've needed, and I've had people take care of me. I've been fine. So I was very comfortable, it just didn't make any difference to me. To be fair, I had parents, you know, I was never going to be homeless. But I felt very comfortable having no money and having no idea where money would come from like this. And I began to notice 
that the people who worried about the fact that we didn't have enough money were not necessarily more vulnerable than I. Almost everyone at Ananda, not everyone, but almost everyone, came from a, 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 a solid family where there were sufficient funds that if any of us really ever needed anything or a home, we had it. We were never really going to be lost and alone in the world, with very few exceptions. But some people had to have a lot more money because money was freedom. Money was power. Money was the ability to change my circumstance if I need it. Money was the security that I can do what I feel I need to do when I need to do it. And so where does my security come from? Now, what we were trying to develop was not faith in Ananda, but we were trying to develop faith in God. We actually had one very interesting conversation in, one of, in those early years, because every so often it would occur to someone that we would not always be young, <laughs> and we would sort of wonder what was going to happen. And this was a, a meeting that happened maybe 15 years in, maybe even 20 years in. Ananda's been 50 years now. And it was a meeting about, like, what are we going to do when we get old? Because we didn't see where it was going to come from. Actually, Ananda has not proved to be as prosperous at this stage as we thought it would. So it's still, it's still been a little catch-as-catch-can, whereas we thought Ananda itself would be, um, well, would be in a position to, to take us through these last years. But it didn't turn out that way, at least not as much as we thought. But there was a conversation where we were all talking with each other about what we are going to do when we got old, what Ananda was going to do for us when we got old. That was the conversation. And Nitai, a very wonderful not renunciate, stood up and said, Ananda doesn't owe me anything. He said, I, I didn't come here expecting Ananda would take care of me. He said, I'm serving Master through Ananda. He said, but my my arrangement is with God, is what he said. And if at the end of my life God wants me to live under a bridge, then that's simply what I'll accept. He said, nobody owes me anything. And that kind of, you know, that was a conversation stopper in terms of that meeting. Um, because institutions have responsibilities and religious organizations have responsibilities. Lots of points. But what he was saying is, where does my security come from? Now, of course, the ultimate security is faith in God. Now, and once you have faith in God, what can touch you? What do I have to be afraid of? And it may still come to us that we end up with a bank account or an, an inherited sum, sum of money or a home that we own. We're not asking ourselves to, to ditch our common sense. But the question is, when everything else is cleared away, where does my security come from? This has been, in the last few months for me, a very, very interesting experience. The, the shelter in place that has been um, put into my life uh, because of the role that I play within Ananda and because of my age and various other things, um, has kind of, in a weird way, has just cleared the, what, I, what I call it's cleared the canvas of my mind, the, the canvas of my consciousness is what I would say. Whereas, until this year, and you, you just don't know what's causing what, but until this year, there were more there were more diversions, and I I what I couldn't see the canvas of my consciousness quite as clearly as I've been looking at it recently, and the field of Kurukshetra has become very, very clear. And all I see is the different warriors from the Pandava side and the Korava side, from the spiritual side and the material side. And they, they confront each other. And the question, security, is a huge one. You know, what do I, what makes me feel safe? And what frightens me? And it just sits there on the field of the white field of Kurukshetra, of my consciousness, and the demand that every question of consciousness be answered on the level of consciousness has become far more central. I think it's partly age. I think it's probably astrological. I'm sure something has happened that has moved me there. But it's been also exceedingly interesting. And 
tremendous amount of it. Not about loyalty, because loyalty in my life as I have lived it has not been the first question. But the question of what makes me feel safe. What do I need to feel safe? It was comical when this first uh, pandemic began and, it, and I was moved into a shelter-in-place position. I had this tremendous thought that I was going to starve. I don't know where it came from. And you know, like everyone did, I just started ordering. And I also thought that I was going to become utterly impoverished. You know, I thought all this was going to happen six days after the whole thing started. So I started immediately eating the cheapest possible diet that I could develop. You know, everything was made from the cheapest ingredients, healthy ingredients, but the cheapest ingredients put together by my own hands in the most austere manner. And it, it all seemed really necessary to me. It was all a very interesting first chakra response. You know, my normal habits are being taken away from me. Where do I go? How do I feel safe? But the question was, how little can I get along with? I lived for the first 10 years of my spiritual life in this small trailer. It was, if I spread my hands out like this, it was just a little bigger than that. It was probably, well, it was a narrow place to sit and meditate, a narrow bed, a sink with a hot plate, a small table. So that's about how long it was. I don't know how long that was. It was this tall <laughs> because when I had to energize inside, and raise my hands. I couldn't raise my hand all the way to there. I could only raise my hand to here. There were a lot of us who would be outside and we'd raise our hands to here because it was such a habit with us because you, all you had to do is do that once and bash your hand against the top. <clears throat> I loved it. No, no electricity. I mean, for heaven's sakes, there was no electricity anywhere. No indoor plumbing. That wasn't even a possibility. After a while, there was a little shower house developed, but it was always kind of moldy and mungy and so I just boiled water and took bucket baths. I mean, that's what I did in this spot. I boiled the water here and I had a little tub and I just took bucket baths for years. Even when I had other choices, I still did it. I just got so used to it. I had long hair, I washed my hair. I love to think I could go back there. And it's sort of like, it's the question I ask myself. Now I live in a really, the only word I can think of it is a lavish, luxurious home. It's just, you know, it's really, it's, Every so often I look at it and I think, how did I get here? You know, just like, how did this happen? For me, it's, it's been, I'm very happy to be there and I'm very grateful for it. But it's, how did it happen? What do I need to feel safe? Okay? So that's what we're working with. And we can look at our lives and ask that question. And if we find that we have, that that first chakra is really leaking, they were always buying and acquiring and needing something new, a new dress, a new thing for the house, you know, a little bit more money, a little bit of this, a, a whatever it might be. We can start, and we will learn before this course is over, some very specific practices that cause us to stand in the, in the divine strength of that chakra. And instead of feeling the power of it you know, reaching out to try to attach itself to this ever-changing ephemeral world, we direct that energy inward. We draw the energy, the life force comes through the medulla, it energizes that chakra, but the energy that we find then shoots up the spine and is used by the spiritual eye. The spiritual eye then directs the earth element in our lives, but it directs it from, not even from the ego, but it directs it from what will bring us to God consciousness. And we can watch those conflicts in us, and believe me, and um, nobody's consistent. Nobody is just like one thing. It, people have this idea, this very linear idea. Well, first I settle the first chakra, check, done. Then I settle the second chakra, check, done. It just doesn't work like that. This is, these are five brothers who are always working together to do this, to, to win this battle. Now, also, each of these chakras represents an aspect of Patanjali's stages of spiritual development. And what the first chakra represents, it's the yamas. And the yamas and the niyamas, yama means that we control, and niyama means we 
allow it to express. We, we don't control it. And so they're the, the, the do's and the don'ts, and they happen to be 10 in number. And it's a wonderful long study in itself. But what we do with the first chakra, and the first chakra, if we go to the um, astrological relationship, which I'm not adept enough to talk about too much, the, the, the planet that is associated with the first chakra is the planet Saturn. And so this is how we have to start. Saturn is what we gather our forces and make ourselves strong. The, um, the yamas, the yamas are expressed in the negative, which is we control the inclination to do that which is delusionary, and then we allow to express um, what is really the truth of our nature. The, the premise of this is that we are de descended from spirit, and all we have to do is remove the mud. We don't have to create the good. So the yamas are five, which are non-violence, non-lying. They're, they're put in this way, and I'll say it in a moment. Non-avarice, non-sensuality, and non-acceptance. I'm not going to go... Well, I'll go a little bit through them because they're important. But each one of these... Um, is also a quality within us which is a way in which we try to assert our energy against the world in a wrong way. So um, ahimsa, which is what nonviolence is, that word ahimsa is better known than some of the other Sanskrit words. It's when we, we, do we act in harmony with the world around us or do we try to use our power to dominate the world around us? And the, the, the question there also is, where do, what makes us secure? You know, are we secure enough that we don't have to try to force the world, the people, and things around us to behave according to our ideas? Um, the non-lying has to do with being able to accept reality as it is, to be able to perceive the truth. Non-lying means truthfulness, but it's instead of perceiving the delusion of the world, we see the reality of the world. If we think of this in terms of where do we find our security. If I see the reality of the world is that God is in charge and divine power, in harmony with divine power, working in attunement with my higher self is where my security comes from, then I don't have to live in the delusion. I can stop lying about where my security comes from and I can have faith in God. When he talks about non-avarice, it's um, what that means is not to crave what isn't yours already. Now, this uh, again goes down to the, the deepest level of who do I think I am and what makes me feel safe. Am I complete and strong in myself as a child of God? Or do I always need to be adding something to make myself feel uh, better and more secure. This is what we were saying. I was saying just a moment ago. You know, if if my security in life comes from my relationship in God, that is sufficient. And avarice is when I'm wanting things that are not really mine. And that's speaking metaphysically, not merely owning. It, um, some people describe that as non-stealing, but but non-avarice is not to want anything that isn't already mine, which leads to non-sensuality also, which is the body wants to have experiences. And, and the body tells us that it's the primary source of our happiness, and it wants to indulge itself. Where does, and, and happiness, security, these are all very interrelated concepts. So non-sensuality is to be, again, complete in myself. I, and, but what myself is, is my energy not expressing, uh, reaching out to the world for its satisfaction, but surrendering itself to my highest nature and letting my life be guided from my highest nature. <clears throat> then the last one is non-acceptance of that which is even my own. And what Swami describes this as <clears throat> not identifying with anything except the divine power within. 
non-acceptance, the, the, the fruit of that is that you remember your past lives, which Swami described as because if you don't accept even this body as our own, where does my security come from? Who am I? What is real? See, that's the question. This body, I have this body. It's young, it's strong, or it's mine. I will protect it like this. In the, in the Mahabharata, part of the conversation in the Gita between Krishna and Arjuna has to do with the fact that it's a war and Arjuna has to kill people. And that's, that's what's being described there. And Krishna says to Arjuna, he said, well, you slay their bodies and you see their bodies fall and you think that you've killed them. He said, but when you slay their bodies, Krishna says, I see their souls rise. And I see far than, instead of them falling, they have, they have risen from this. So where does my security come from? What is the greatest fear that people have, besides public speaking, apparently, is death. And death of the physical body or death, death of the people that I love, death of my position in the world, death of my youth, death of my health, death of my money. Where does my security come from? And so the yamas, which is what this represents also, is that we are able to stand strong in the truth without reaching out for all these realities that are not ours. Now, the thing is, however, if we just become, as I was starting to say, the negative side of the earth chakra is that we become fanatical and that we have one truth and that's the only truth that we can have. So this is why all the brothers have to work together. So we have a commitment. I know who I am. I know what I believe in. I know what my goals are in life. And it doesn't matter if the road is hard and rocky. I remember vividly about five years onto the spiritual path. It was sort of a joke. It was, it was a, a rueful joke is what I would call it, where those of us who had all, <clears throat> all started out together, <clears throat> and not being very old anyway, five years was a pretty high percentage of our entire life, and it defined almost our entire adulthood. So it seemed like a lot of time. From where I stand now, five years just is just a minute. It just goes by. But we were really deep into the spiritual path, and it was proving to be a more arduous and a longer journey than we expected. And the, the humor that we came up with, just to keep ourselves entertained, was that we'd seen this beautiful island out there, and we had just rushed into the water and just like crazy started swimming to it, you know? Master had told us that this is what was going to happen. We take Kriya, we serve, we build a nun, and we were just swimming along like this. But somehow, you know, distances are deceiving. And no matter how hard we swam, that, that island was still a lot farther away. But then when we turned back and looked to the shore, so to speak, of the life that we'd left behind, of who we used to be before we mad made this mad dash into the lake to swim across it, and the, the shore was also pretty far behind. And we were <sighs> beginning to pant. So we would sort of joke about we'd just kind of get in a cluster and tread water and kind of discuss our options, you know. But the only option was to keep swimming. Because really, where could I go? There's a beautiful exchange between Jesus and Peter in the Bible. At the end of Jesus' life, when he knew what was coming, he knew he needed to cull the, cull the herd a little bit. And that, that the ones who were left needed to be very strong together because they would be severely tested, which they were. And it's not that Jesus abandoned the other disciples. He just needed to make sure that there was a, a, an unshakable core. So he started saying things like, eat my body and drink my blood, which uh, there was no Catholic church to explain the symbology of it. He just said it like that. And... Uh, the Bible that I enjoy reading, which is the Jerusalem Bible, I just happen to like that translation. The, um, it says in that book, the disciples said one to another, this is a hard teaching. <laughs> I love it. You know, they go out of some, they've had dinner with Jesus, they've been in the temple with him, and he's been telling them to eat my body and drink my blood. And they're, you know, they're just rolling their eyes and looking at each other. They're kind of going out and it's like, 
you know, is he nuts? I mean, that's what they're actually saying to each other. And then it says, from that point, many walked with him no more. That was, that was what Jesus was, he was testing them. You know, will you be confused by mere words? Or do you know what you're doing beyond something as superficial as a confusing teaching? <clears throat> so he, he said to Peter, and the way I see this scene in my mind was, you know, who knows? Maybe all of Peter's best friends had just walked away. Maybe they had all come together, <clears throat> as I did with my batchmates, as they say in India, my, my ashram batchmates. There was a, a crowd of us and almost all of us. I would say, let me think. I think of that original batch, all of us. All, of our, my, all my true batchmates from the beginning are, are still present, or they've left the planet. But if they haven't left the planet, they haven't left this path. We've all hung together. But maybe Peter's batchmates were leaving. So Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? Just, I mean, he didn't say, this is what you must do. I'm sure he asked it just like that. Because that was the question, what are you going to do? And Peter said, are you going, and Jesus said, are you going to leave me? And Peter said, where would I go? Brilliant answer. I love that answer. I meditate on it all the time. Where would I go? Peter did not explain to Jesus what the symbology of the odd teaching was. There's no sign in the Bible that Peter was any less confused than those other disciples but his first chakra was absolutely committed to the Christ. And there was just nothing, there was nothing that could move him off of that. Uh, except when Jesus was actually crucified, then he got scared for one night. But by the morning he had recovered and he never wavered again. But if we get too fanatical, we can get... Um, we can head in the wrong direction and we can impose our will on other people. We can do all sorts of things we shouldn't do. So once we know who we are, we don't have to always be fighting for it. People who are too fanatical, it's almost always because even consciously, but certainly subconsciously, they're very insecure. There's just, there's just no possibility of another truth but this one. It has to be this truth. This Jesus has to be the only Savior. There just can't be another. One of the problems with the path of self-realization, especially the way it's practiced at Ananda, is that the form is very soft. <laughs> you really can't find the dogmas. You get guidelines. There are certainly truths, but there's no, like, this is what you do, this is what you look like, this is what you do. You know, there's a lot of paths that are just very, very exact. This is not one of them. This one has to be, you have to have it in your own chakra. You have to know what you're doing. But what, what went for the, for the earth chakra to really work properly, it has to be solid enough in its own sense of identification that it can also be fluid. Because form is just form. It's not, form is not what we're committed to. What we're committed to is the energy of the truth. So when we get to water, we're in a very interesting reality. I've picked this glass up several times. This glass is filled with water. Anyone who knows what water is looks at it. You look at it, you're looking at water. But the water actually looks like the glass, doesn't it? But if I pour the water into my hand, all of a sudden the water looks like my hand. If I put the water in my hair, all of a sudden the water looks like my hair. But every place it is, it's still the water. So this is how we progress. You know, I am a disciple of a great master. Swami Kriyananda is the pole star of my life. My dedicated service is to sharing with everyone that I can the understanding of self-realization that's been given to me for the benefit of those who want to hear it. But how do I do that? How does a person do that? You know, some people sing. Some people raise children, some people educate children, some speak as I'm speaking, some go into silence and do nothing but meditate. And the, the water element allows us to, to feel that my commitment is my consciousness. My commitment is my energy. It's always recognizably water, but it has the capacity 
to do what it needs to do without feeling threatened. And so this again is, what is my security? When I, was, when I had to move out of that uh, little trailer, and Swamiji, it, it just, various things happened, and Swamiji wanted us to build a house at, at, at Crystal Hermitage. That house now is the guest house for Crystal Hermitage, where you can go and you can uh, spend the night there. And there was a, a little um, uh, hut. There was a hut on that same spot, but the hut was uninhabitable. It just, it, it, was, it was a cave. It just, it simply didn't work. So I said, we'll build a little house. And then he said, go out and give classes and earn the money to build a little house, which is actually <laughs> how he got me out of the nest. That's how he kicked me out of the nest. So all of a sudden, we're building this little house. And this little house, if you're going to build a house, you build it nicely. I mean, why would you build it badly? It panicked me. It absolutely panicked me. Because as long as I was living in a trailer that was not barely wider than my hands, where I had to energize with a bent wrist, I was poor. And if I was poor, I was spiritual. It was just as simple as that. I didn't know that's how I felt. I didn't know that's how I felt until the concept of putting wallpaper in the bathroom came up. <laughs> First of all, there was a bathroom. I mean, that was enough. But then we could put wallpaper in the bathroom. It, it, just, I, I, it doesn't sound like anything to me now, but my concept of my loyalty to the spiritual path was stuck on the form of being poor. And could I actually live in what the phrase that we, I loved it because we all used the phrase at the time, could I actually live in a, a real house <laughs> and still be spiritual? Well, some people couldn't. If you're so firm here, but you don't have enough of the water element. But because Swami Kriyananda had asked me to do it, you know, my two, the two forces were going like this because my loyalty was to him, his guidance, and he was ripping me out of my zone, and there I was. I had another one with Swami on this one. I got to forget all these things because they happened so long ago. I was, uh, it was another part of that same thing. I was indifferent to my appearance to the point where eyesore might have actually been the right word for it, as Swami said. It's really a service to others to dress nicely because, after all, they're the ones who have to look at you. So in the name of not being vain, I was actually... I, I wasn't messy. I, I, was, I just didn't have any taste. That was actually the only way I could think to put it. I deliberately didn't have any taste. And uh, I, I, Swami took a group of us to Carmel, which we would go for occasionally. He liked to visit Carmel. And I was there, and... I was getting dressed for us to go out to dinner, and I remember I had this long a, a skirt that was a brown batik and this kind of brown sweater that went over it. I thought it was pretty classy. And Swami looked at it and asked me if that was the only thing I had brought with me, and it was pretty much the only thing I brought with me because we were day, there for a day or so. And uh, he said, well, we're going to have to buy you a new dress. Now, bear in mind, I get $50 a month in cash, and that's all the money I have. We're already in Carmel. He would take us on these trips. I still do not know how we managed to pay for them because none of us had any money, but we always managed to go to a motel and to go out to dinner and all this stuff. I, I really seriously think he did it just to teach us about the flow of money. So the next day, we go out, and he takes us shopping. And, and I'm like, I'm absolutely like just frozen. And he pulls out this dress, and it's a, a shirt waist dress, and it's this white cotton eyelet fabric like this. I mean, just a perfectly plain cotton dress. But I put the thing on, and it just came to just below my knee, and you know, sort of like this. And it was slightly transparent, and I didn't have the proper slip, so you could actually see my underwear through it, you know, here, like this. And Swami says, Pretend it's her bathing suit. That's what he says to the other people like this. And so I have to, like, and he puts this dress on me, and I have to walk around, and fortunately someone had a slip, so I managed to put the slip on like this. So I, and it costs $75, and he makes everybody contribute to pay for it. 
And so for the weekend, I had to walk around in this white dress. I mean, I just walked around like this. I was just absolutely beside myself. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. And then we're, Swami has been sarcastic with me. The, I, I seem to remember there were two, two, there were twice. This was the first time. <laughs> At that time, after Sunday service, uh, we used to have what we called the farm tour. That's what we called the community area. After Sunday service, someone would stand up. Those of you who would like a tour of the farm, you know, meet me after lunch and we'll show you what we're doing here in this community. So I'm standing here in this white dress. We're about to go back to Ananda Village, you know, to our country home. I said, uh, do I have to wear this when we get back to Ananda? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, let's put it in a glass case and make it part of the farm tour. <laughs> he said to me, but I have to say, I, never, I, I was never able to put the thing on again. Never. And ironically, when I moved from the village to Palo Alto, this is how it works. We, you know, all these boxes moving a whole household. One box was lost. Swami had also bought me a gift a few years later of this beautiful wool, blue wool. Um, from, it was from Scotland, a blue wool sweater. The sweater and the white dress were in one box. And because of the way I related to that light, white dress, one box was lost. And that was the box that was lost. It was just <laughs> taken away from me like that. Now, here we are at the first chakra. I'm poor. I'm homely. I'm, I'm not attentive to my appearance, you know. Therefore, I'm spiritual. And that was, that was it. That was 100% of what I was doing. And it wasn't God-inspired. And he just started doing this to it, which is why, you know, you can't just make up rules about this. You have to actually ask, not what do, what do I think I'm doing, but what am I actually doing? What is really motivating me? What is at the core? You know, where does my security come from? Oh, my security comes from being a devotee of God. But what does it mean to be a devotee of God? Well, I'm poor. And I'm ugly, you know, therefore, clearly, I'm serious on the spiritual path. No, I don't think so. The form is not, not the truth. So we move to the second chakra because water in a glass looks like this, and my hair looks like this, and in my hand looks like this. But it's still the same. And this is how we, the five Pandavas, gradually work together to win the war. Okay, my friends. That's it for tonight. We'll see you in a week. God bless you.